Uh, we've got Eero Carrera with us now. Hey, Eero, how's it going? Hey, good. Uh, thanks for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. How's everything with you? Uh, good, good. Well, as good as things can be in you know in the current <laughs> situation, but pretty good. Wonderful. So for the folks who do not know, Eero is one of our trainers with the HITV SEC train and he would be having a training thing next month or in two months' time, I believe. But the main reason he is here is to talk about threat intelligence and AI and all that good stuff. Uh, Eero, why don't you give us a background by yourself before we start? Okay, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, but uh, I've been I've been around uh, twenty years. I'm rounding up a bit, uh, rounding down actually. On the, I'm old. On this industry, uh, I worked in. Uh, I started in FCQ, doing uh, malware analysis, malware research. Uh, then spent uh, some years working with Halbert Flake in Cynamics and, and the whole team there, um, and VirusTotal. And and the last ten years, I spent at Google uh, doing doing. Large-scale malware analysis and and then focusing more on threat intelligence and automating threat threat intelligence analysis with the kind of tools you have at a place like Google. So you know I've I've gone uh, I've I've touched on different parts of the whole infosec spectrum um, and you know had a lot of fun doing it. Nice. So you said the tools they have at Google, right? So what would be the main difference between a TI team in Google and maybe a Normal MNC or a company that's trying to mature their TI program. That's that's a really good question. Um, but I think a, a big difference revolves around um, how normalized at a place like Google the use of large scale databases is. Uh, and I think when I talked when I was working there and I talked to people outside, for within Google you take for granted that you're gonna just put all of your data, whatever that data is that you use for threat intel in a database. And all of your data can be billions of rows, terabytes and terabytes of data, and just query it as many times as you need instantly, pretty much. And um, as you may imagine, that makes certain kind of workflows incredibly fast and powerful, while the only thing that you have is just a fancy, <laughs> just a fancy uh, database. Um, but, but that's such a incredible difference to have that that foundational tooling at that scale um it's funny because it doesn't really have mean that you have to push you know crazy machine machine uh, learning uh or you know any any especially fancy techniques you just have very basic tools at an extreme scale are so powerful of course then you can build on top of that but i would say that's a pretty key uh, difference, just how much of an enabler a good infrastructure can be. Right, and, and they always say, right, with the tools you need the expertise of the people to operate it. So, I mean, what kind of uh, background or expertise are we talking about here? As for the team, you mean? So, the, the team, uh, actually, the threat analysis group was... was I think I was lucky to to end up working with such a team uh, because I think it was probably probably has parallels in other in other organizations uh, at the level of Google. But you know, Google being Google, uh, it was when I joined a team of around twenty people, and we had uh, people coming from different you know government uh, intelligence agencies. We had some of the top reverse engineers uh, and vulnerability researchers in the world. Uh, we have amazing threat intelligence analysts. Uh, with domain expertise in the cyber world. Um, so it was, you know, of course, you join the tooling with the level of skills and the focus there. And it was, in a way, easy to get some good results. Um, uh, so, yeah, so it was a varied and extremely, extremely skilled team. And it was quite a privilege to work there for, for the time that I did. Nice, nice, and and I think with TI the main the main importance is the freshness of the data, right? Helps a lot, but uh, but I wouldn't actually um, uh, you know discard the fact that having some sort of history and background is useful as well. Of course, you know there is limited use to having you know indicators from ten years ago. But having having a database that that keeps some context, maybe for a few years, sometimes sometimes some 
actors reuse infrastructure for a long time. So, of course, fresh data is relevant to study current threats and current ongoing attacks. But if you want to be able to read a fuller picture of threat actors across time, how they evolve, uh, keeping that historical context as much as possible, as much as you can afford it in your databases, and as well as doesn't make the intelligence workflow more complex, I think there is value in that. Okay, and, and how does AI or ML play a part in this? Um, in a way, I think I sometimes may sound a bit as a, not a disbeliever, but a skeptical about AI and ML. While, you know, I'm teaching a training on that, so it's kind of maybe a little bit uh, <laughs> funny. But, uh, but the thing is, because I grew, you know, my background is as a hacker, you know, as a teenager, I was cracking software and, and, you know, and always learning things by myself. So I came to machine learning, uh, in the beginning with a lot of skepticism, thinking, you know, this cannot do magic. Uh, and it, that's the truth. It cannot do magic, but it can automate a lot of things. And if you're a person that, you know, once you understand the problem, you'd rather be working on something new. And machine learning is a fantastic way of actually, uh, in a, in a very principled way, teach or have the computer learn some patterns in the workflow that you're doing or in the data to actually then have the computer do it repeatedly so you don't waste your time and you can move to something else. So I think within the threat intelligence scape, and you know, be it malware analysis, be it actually analyzing and working with intelligence, techniques, be it, you know, glorified uh, uh, automated uh, automation, glorified automation, machine learning, or, you know, full-on AI, AI, deep, deep neural networks, it's a broader spectrum of, you know, complexity there. But, uh, there, there are pockets, there are specific niches where many of these techniques can be applied and will, you know, boost and empower your team. It will, it will free resources. The human resources are always the most expensive, getting skilled people and then making good use of those people. So applying machine learning, applying automation in the right spots, frees humans to do the right thing and, you know, invest in, invest their brains in, in the interesting parts of the problem. So I think that's the interplay um, of, of using humans well and have the machines do what the humans don't want to do and it's routine. I think that's, that's, that's the ideal case. Right. I see you came just in time for the AI part, Dylan. <laughs> of course, bro. I won't miss the AI, baby. How are you, bro, man? Nice to see you, brother. Yeah, man, it's been a while. It's been a while. Nice to see you too, man. man. Yeah, 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 good times, good times, man. I don't know, it's been more than 10 years probably, I think, since I last saw you, but, you know, it feels like, feels like that. I, mean. <laughs> I think it's been like that, yeah. But talking about the AI, man, like, you know, when it comes to modeling, right, like the feature extraction side of things, right, like, how do you even begin to, to decide what's going to be modeled, what you're going to model your, your you know, your deep yeah. neural network, right, like, how are you going to decide right. on the feature? Right, that's that's always been my main thing. As in, you know, cleaning the data is a bitch. Everybody hates that. I, 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 I'm 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 very happy that you use such a graphic language because <laughs> yes, I entirely agree. And actually, um, yeah, I, you 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 just hit the spot. Uh, I mean, I didn't want to reveal too many things from my training, but uh, no, but uh, we're gonna be definitely be touching on that because I think, and actually, I've sat in pitches for a startup where you know the big boss was. Uh, uh, selling the idea, we have lots of data, we have the best, and now we put it together, magic happens. As, you know, as a practitioner, kind of me wanting to raise my hands, like, maybe not that easy, because it's exactly that. You know, you, you will have the best machine learning algorithms, you will have expertise, and still you will spend 90% of the time debug, debug, I mean, there is such a thing as debugging your data, because you'll try, you realize that the data is not as clean as you thought, always happens uh, then you'll ha have to go back if your workflow allows you to what data was wrong why is it wrong was it entered incorrectly was it labeled incorrectly this is a broad spectrum of things that can be wrong with the data uh, was it acquired incorrectly a problem with the sensor a problem with the tool that generated the data uh, different tools will generate alarms or trigger or generate logs for different events, not necessarily in a consistent way. And if you throw it in the same bucket and try to learn from it, you're not. Or you're going to learn really weird things. So having a very clear workflow from data to to classification, to, to the result of the pipeline, and being able to go, whenever you find cases that don't make any sense, being able to go back 
to what data generated uh, that that label that labeling that verdict from the from the system critical and that's why personally uh, the times we have applied uh, machine, in the, machine learning to to threat intelligence generally we have been shy away from the class of algorithms that tend to be more opaque like neural networks are fantastic for some specific tasks like image recognition but they are uh, knowingly hard to debug in that if, the, if, a, if a classification is wrong it's very hard to ask the machine learning algorithm, the model, why did you do this? Well, there are a class of algorithms, the simpler ones, if you will, but the st- ex- still extremely powerful, logistic regression, uh, Bayesian net- networks, random forest, where you yeah. can actually go back to the algorithm and see what weights were wrong, and from those weights, see what data actually, what were those inputs, and then actually iterate. And I think in, in these kind of workflows, that iteration, that being able to, to go from bad classification to what the data fixing, understanding the data better and have that loop a few times, that's where it gets you to something that you can actually deploy. Mm. Yeah, and also, I mean, the fine-tuning the, the parameters as well, right? Parameter fine-tuning is, in itself is an art, you know what I mean? Like, that, it is. It's attempting to converge properly and not oversee yes. it. <laughs> yes, yes, entirely. So, so sorry that to your original question about feature extraction and uh, feature engineering, uh, that that's that's a mix of you know having good domain expertise in your team because if you have you know, and I've seen cases where you get really good machine learning engineers and throw them to a problem where none of them have a lot of domain expertise and sure they're gonna make the algorithms fly, but but they don't understand. They will not understand in the beginning the intricacies of, of the data. You know, is it, is it something coming from a sandbox? What does it mean to have this API call and this argument? How can you debug that? So having somebody that is an, an expert on understanding the data helps. So that helps that feature engineering, that, that first connect the dots of like, this should help, this shouldn't. Uh, and then yes, you need that as well expertise in machine learning to, to, to understand the behavior of the algorithm. Is it fitting right? Is it overfitting? Uh, do you, is, is the, if you're using a neural network, is it deep enough? Do you have enough parameters to encode this kind of information? Do you need, you know, two classes? Do you need a multi-class classifier? Uh, all of those things is something that where you actually need the domain, the, the domain expertise in machine learning as well. So having this kind of teams with the, with expertise well combined, not trivial. Are there already Jupyter notebooks and stuff that people can just like, you know, fire up? And then just pump in some whatever XLS or LE structured data of some sort into it mm-hmm. so that it's doing some features? Uh, there are. I mean, and, and depending on the tools that you go, I, that can always be a first attempt, right? Just to get some of the, you know, get TensorFlow, get maybe something simpler like SciPy to, uh, Scikit to start with. And, you know, load the CSV file, load the Excel file, apply some of the basic algorithms, see where they fail, understand this. I mean, and I'm talking really simple. Maybe some of them don't take uh, like continuous features. Maybe some of them don't take discrete features. I understand that. Understand why that algorithm doesn't do that. And why do you want to do it? Do you need discrete features for this? So, I mean, I started knowing nothing about machine learning. So it's like regression, classification, clustering. All of these are different ways of, you know, different outputs of machine learning algorithms. So, you know, you have some kind of drag and drop things that you can try, but you need to develop as well the expertise and, and, and some of the, some expectations and intuitions about what, what each of the major algorithms can output. Yeah. To already start on the right track. Mm. What about uh? Have you looked at uh, capsule networks? Is it like that seems to be the new shit, right? With LSTM stuff combined with deep. Yeah. Like so. I I have not. Most of the data sets that I worked with personally mm-hmm. um were not necessarily time dependent in the in the way that an LSTM you know. LSTMs, I think, could have worked well. Never tried that, but, but in the case of analyzing a, a behavioral traits on application yeah, yeah. over time, so I never, you know, the, the problems, specific problems where I where I worked were uh, actually recognizing uh, code to to 
eight massive disassemblies. So at Google, we disassembled all the software that, you know, we, we got from all of the sources. So doing that at scale, being able to recognize all of different compiler patterns, so where, where to start disassembling is actually a problem that just either doesn't scale that, that, that far, right? So we had to attack it on our own. So, so we built some models to recognize code and that works surprisingly well, but it was a very specific niche problem that gave a lot of returns. But you know, who needs to build a machine learning model to disassemble? Not that yeah. many people, but the Google we did. And then uh, machine learning around around threat intelligence, around actually ranking evidence. So again, that was not a very specific uh, an instance of, of, of a problem where, where uh, anything from the family of deep networks was applicable. Uh, I know they were being used for the standard image recognition, OCR in documents and extracting text. It's like, you know, works. Um, but not necessarily for, uh, I don't remember instances in our workflows where we were using them to, in the intelligence analysis workflow, because, because as well, the, the, the decisions that were made there, you know, about some infrastructure being related to an actor, sometimes then actions, we needed to take actions on that infrastructure. Uh, maybe it means sinkholing it. Maybe it means something different. And uh, we need to be able to to debug those actions. If lawyers later come and say, why did you do this? We can't say the machine said so. We need to, you know, I mean, I, I wish. We, we, we need to say, <laughs> yeah, uh, we need to be able to say, you know, we use, we use some techniques, but this is the trail of evidence. So we need algorithms that, that could provide, you know, the decision as well as why that reasoning was reached uh, so it can be justified. So when, when the stakes are high in the decision, sometimes that conditions the kind of algorithms that, that you can use. You know, sorry, just let me pause you there for a quick second. Um, we just got sure. Dennis who joined in as well. Dennis hey, is nice. a fellow trainer uh, with IT Sec Train and HITV uh, Sec Train, who is Hi, talking about championing security programs, if I'm not wrong. Hey, Dennis, how's it going? Um, as usual, you know, uh, it's quite spontaneous, but anyway, we are here. Exactly, yeah. So just feel free to jump in into the topic, right? It's, it's, we're just keeping it casual. So if you have anything to input, we can go with that. We'll, we'll obviously come to you in a short bit as well. And, uh, just, just, uh, I listened a little bit about, uh, some models that you train something, you train to extract something. And, uh, you know, that's a quite hot topic because, because you need to, uh, protect machine learning by itself also. So mm -hmm. that's why I think as an industry, you need to keep your model safe. You need to keep the personal data. If we talking about the, um, the personal data in the uh, data sets. So we need to protect it. So maybe, maybe next training will be also how to protect things that protect us. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, that true. You know, actually, you know, uh, then, uh, Dennis, you, you make an important point because last year we had a paper about reversing the black box models, right? Because like everybody says AI is like a black box, right? Like you just put some data inside it and then some answer comes out and you're like, how, why did it come up with the answer? I have no idea, bro, but that's the answer it came out. But being able to reverse those models is cool because then you can learn from it, but it becomes a, an IP issue when you start reversing like, self-driving cars <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and figure out how those cars are making the decisions on whether they, you know, go faster, go slower, whatever, right? Like, so the reverse engineering of AI models in itself is like a super, super interesting area. And I think right now, a lot of machine learning practitioners, they only release partial code, but the actual, you know, you want the weights because like Google has TPUs and they've got like amazing amount of resources, right? I've got a stupid ass NVIDIA GPU. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do anything with that, right? So, but at the end of the day, the, the, that fully compiled model, right? Like with the weights, that's what everybody wants. And then the retrainable layer. So everything at the, all the way up to the last layer. And then I just have to retrain just a little bit, but folks don't release that. So, <laughs> yeah. How I roll, how man, give us some bro. <laughs> <laughs> That's the secret sauce. No, but uh, it is it is uh, true. It is an actual problem, and uh, not just about reversing in the model itself. In some inter instances, that can be the problem. But um, but as well, sometimes you know, it's the oracle problem. If 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 an attacker can actually guess why the model knows what it knows, maybe it actually is a window to the data that you have about them. And uh, and in many instances, uh, I, you know, I've been in places where you can't really 
publicly admit to a certain verdict or judgment just because that will tell the adversary what you know about them. And it's more valuable to keep that secret and keep collecting information or tracking them than actually revealing it. So, so I mean, not just the model itself by, by, by the pro intellectual property that it encodes, but actually because of the information that it may reveal you're able to acquire is, is worth protecting. So, so, you know, as well, that depends what, what the model, what the model, you know, if, if it's trained on images that are publicly available, probably not so important to protect. But if a lot of, uh, you know, uh, private information goes into that model, user private or company private information. It's, it becomes really valuable and something you have to protect, even protect at the, at the amount, of, at the level of limiting the amount of inferences you allow other people to do with because then they mm -hmm. could query, 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 query and kind of like learn everything that the model knows, which is something you don't want them to do. Or yeah. another attack vector, if you have some, some decision-making processes that relies on your, on your network, if you can affect the process, you don't need the, the internals. You just need to mm -hmm. affect it somehow. To, to change the decision and that's it. This attack was successful. So it means that decision making process is quite important also. Very true. And I mean, if you can influence the, the output of what the model is going to detect, then the operator is going to take that as gospel. Right? The machine is yes. going to say, no threats here, bro, everything all good. And yeah, the operator is going to say, yeah, it's all good. Right? The model came out and said, fine. So then uh, nobody's going to verify it. Or you all have the reverse where, you know, false positives also could be another, another false flag, basically, right? You can't plant false flags in the data because you know the model is going to pick up for that. Mm -hmm. Or it's kind of biased towards that. So you can then hide your stuff below it, right? Mm -hmm. It's interesting, man. I love the AI stuff, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And actually, just recently, uh, learned about this, this class of problems as well. Um, where, where the attack is actually on the, on the computational part of the inference. Like the models, when they process the input data to make an inference, they, there are paths that are more expensive at the level of the weights and the part of the model that is invoked to actually make the inference. So depending how you construct the data, you can actually overload or lead to extreme costs at the level of making the inferences, how, depending how you present the data. So you can, you know, do a denial of service of a model just by, by presenting, you know, extremely ex expensive to evaluate examples. Of course, that requires being able to, you know, have an understanding of how that model works and what's expensive for it, but probably you can just do by trial and error end up in, in finding those little things. Hmm. Yeah, that's going to be quite interesting and it's almost impossible to solve again because like, uh, how the hell are you going to, how do you, how do you model that trap? You know what I mean? <laughs> how do you well, even say what is actually valid and what isn't, right? Like if somebody's yeah. just going to be spending very small bits. Yeah, you can, thing. but probably, probably you can limit, uh, talking with some distance from understanding the actual problem here, but, uh, but probably you could, you could try to, you know, the same way as you deal with sim, sim bombs, right? Or you used to, or you try just, you know, some things you try to, uh, when try to uh, decompress them, go over certain size, kill the process. So in a way, you know, you, you kind of uh, limit the number of resources per job, per inference job, so that if, if it goes crazy, then you can assume maybe an attack is going on and just, uh, just, you know, but I don't know. Actually, I don't know if the inference, uh, infrastructure is built, the TensorFlow and everything that is built at CloudScale even consider such scenarios. So probably they don't really have a way of, you know, dedicating a, you know, only 0.0001% to each inference and otherwise kill it. But they will have to think about that eventually. So there's a lot of definitely, it's, it's a new paradigm and there are a lot of security vectors to it. Unless you're Google, right? Because then you don't really care. <laughs> yeah, we solve everything. Yeah, yeah, we never have any, any problems. Yeah. Yeah, just process it, bro. It's fine, right? We have TPUs anyway. But do you sure. actually have access to a TPU? I mean, like, you know, personally, as in, like, can you compile code on TPUs and, and your yeah, models? Yeah, in, inside the company, uh, do, do, I mean, so, some models, you know, maybe the newer models were more limited to the specific teams that have the, the highest computational need. But yeah. in general, there were, there were several generations of, of TPUs available and you choose where to run on normal CPU, TPU. Sometimes you just say whatever is available and, and yeah. From that point of view, uh, Google is, is quite amazing. Cool, man. 
Hey, so Dennis, what you've been working on, bro? Like, I mean, I'm guessing you're not into the AI stuff. <laughs> what have you been working on, man? Um, in the context of machine learning, it's pretty fun that you know that some frameworks, like uh, open source frameworks for for model training and processing, uh, like Acumos, uh, they have the multi distributed multiple components inside for operations of the model, for training the model, for uh, I don't know. No, I'm not an expert. I just look at this as a pen tester and. Uh, a lot of things, a lot of toys inside this uh, this big environment. And sometimes, if your model is successful, you need to touch some endpoint uh, to make some decision. Like the model decide that is a cat. Please touch this endpoint. So, and sometimes you can identify vulnerabilities in these uh, systems, like uh, server side request forgery, for example. And uh, you can touch without any trainings, without uh, any processing. You don't need to understand what happens in the model. You just need to touch this uh, this endpoint by yourself. And your attack will be successful. So that's where where application security starts. I think adversarial attacks ends when <laughs> when application security starts. And sometimes um, you don't need to be to be the expert in machine learning. You don't need to waste your time as attacker to train the model, to bypass the model, to bypass the filter. But you just need to find one SSRF, and that's it. So that's why I'm I'm going to talking about uh, I'm going to talk about application security and uh, during during uh, some uh, research, pen test, external pen test, uh, maybe it's like personal research, including machine learning stuff. Uh, we think that, uh, the standard mistakes happens 10 years. The same, not, the same vulnerabilities, different code, different languages, different, uh, you know, frameworks, different skill set of developers, but the same mistakes. If you, uh, look at top 10 or ask top 10, uh, something changed, not sure, uh, just maybe names of the vulnerabilities, names, titles, but techniques of exploitation, techniques of uh, uh, finding the same. And uh, I think the one main bug here in application security is in human DNA. Yes, we need to fix the human DNA. And uh, that's why that's why I think uh, leading uh, independent organizations like OWASP, Open Web Application Security Project, they decide not only to share with the people some methodologies, some tools, but also some programs like uh, security championship programs. And uh, it means that they try to fix not only uh, the process of SDLC, yes, not only weaknesses in the process of software development lifecycle, but a uh, human factor in this lifecycle. It means that you need to prepare not a security dedicated expert in your team, uh, you need to prepare ex security expert in each developer of your organization. <laughs> and, uh, during, during, uh, during some, some of the carriers, I think, uh, we have some experience to deploy this program, to implement the program, to understand the pain points. Is it, uh, how to teach your developer to be a little bit security ninja? Just, uh, not to use, uh, SAS, DAST, or et cetera, but how to fix the code. So, because you know, uh, if you fix the vulnerability and the latest stage of release, it means you will spend more money. You need to move to the left. You need to fix the vulnerability from the code. And only one solution that helps you to do that, it's, uh, it's the people who press, produce the code, yes? Uh, of course, you can organize the bug bounty program. You can organize uh, the penetration testing, crowdsourcing for this problem. But it will be, it will be just a fixing of symptoms, not a root cause stuff. Uh, that's, that's, uh, I'm going to talk about. But I mean, when you talk about application security, I think a lot of times the developer mistakes, right? Uh, simply because they're cutting and pasting shit from, you know, Stack Overflow, right? <laughs> so, good examples that are given that already have bugs in them and then, you know, they're just reusing that or it's libraries. And that's also another issue, right? Like, I mean, a lot of times we just leverage whatever framework, library, especially Python, right? Like, you just whatever include. Into the library, let's import this, import this, import everything. Stack exchange. Right? But then, yeah, and that, that stuff has vulnerabilities. And then, you know, you can't really, you don't really think about it because you kind of pasted it. <laughs> now your entire app is screwed, right? Yes, correct. And education of developer, it's a little bit different process than education of hacker, for example. If uh, you see some, some trying, try to educate yourself, you will see, uh, some deep technical programs that requires you to uh, learn tools for for attackers, yeah, that's some something that's trivial. But developers, it's a little bit different mindset. So for developers, security is like one feature. Yeah, you don't need to open your burp suit every time when you produce the code because you're a developer, you waste the money of company. That's why you need just to understand is your code correct or not. 
is uh, earlier. So it's a little bit different approach for, for the training programs for developers. And uh, I think uh, championship, it's, it means that we don't need to prepare security experts, but we need to prepare development experts in security stuff. Oh, sounds fascinating. Um, unfortunately, I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, oh, yeah. Just, sorry, Dylan? Yeah, it, uh, I just noticed the time. Uh, just for everyone to know, uh, both Eero and, and... Oh, man, Dennis, sorry. Uh, Dennis, I'm having trainings uh, next month uh, with HITV Set Train, courtesy of IT Set Train. Do go to the website and check them out. They look to be pretty cool. They're just four-hour lab sessions, but I'm sure it's full of information based on what you've just heard, right? I think, Dylan, you want to do a closing key for today? Well, not a key. All right, all right. <laughs> I see a few words. So, yeah, hey, Aero and Dennis, thanks so much for joining us, guys. Like, you know, looking forward to seeing your lab. I think that's happening next month, right? So, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not sure what the time zone is, but it's on the website somewhere. So, for you guys that want to learn more about, you know, machine learning stuff and all these good things that Dennis was talking about and Aero as well, uh, they got a four hour lab. So, that's going on next month, I think. Next month or in July. So, sign up for that. It's on the HTTP Sec Train website. So, you can go and take a look at that. 